Uh, I just want to share a little bit of my heart today. And, uh, you know, we've been talking in Four Collins about this thing called moments. And there's moments in our lives that define us. There's moments in our lives, experiences that we have that are really profound. Like for me, you know, getting married was a profound moment. Someone married me. Wow. You know, uh, having kids was a profound moment. You know, starting areas of ministry and doing great moving to Colorado was a defining moment. Uh, whenever, you know, the Cowboys are mathematically eliminated from the playoffs, it's like just a great moment. <laughs> when Tom Brady loses a Super Bowl, it's a great moment. Yeah, come on. But some of us have moments that uh, define us, and they maybe aren't the best moments. I want to talk a little, about, a bit, a little bit about that today. Uh, last weekend, two weekends ago, my son turned 11, which is crazy. And uh, we went to Horse Tooth Reservoir, if you've been there, and we, went, we were going to swim and cook burgers and and one of his friends got him this little raft that you pump up and so these kids you know 11 11 year olds oh gosh uh jumped in this little raft and we're swim you know boating around the reservoir there and you know how 11 year olds are they get a little you know rowdy and they tend to go further than they should and so then they're kind of out into the reservoir and i'm like i walked over hey come back come back and as i'm walking back i see a ranger boat come and they come up to the boat and they say, hey, are you, how old are you? And they say 11. They're like, okay, you need to go back. And I'm like trying to get them to come back, come on. And when they come back, I say, you guys are in big trouble. The cops are coming. That's what I say. And then I turn around and there's a cop. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is so awkward right now. And, um, and he's like, you know, kids need life jackets in boats. And I was like, never thought about it. Didn't even cross my mind that kids, uh, some of you who are older, uh, I'm almost 40, No, when you were a kid, you didn't have a life jacket. When we were kids, we didn't have helmets. When we were kids, we didn't wear shoes on our bikes. We did fireworks in the street with no shirts on. It was great. <laughs> but in this day and age, and there's, so I had a moment, I had a defining moment where I got a ticket for risking the life of 11, 11-year-olds. 11 and I was like, you know, if I would have thought through that a little bit more, I probably wouldn't have done that. So we all have things like that, right? You and I, we all have things where like, you look back, you're like, if I would have thought a little more about that, or if I would have made a better decision, that's probably not the best decision I could make. And just so you know, God can use the good decisions in your life, but God definitely wants to use the bad decisions in your life. God will define you, not by your bad decisions, but he might even grow you more through your bad decisions than through your good. Because God is all about getting your heart and doing a work deep inside your life, and less about your performance or how well you do. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness that goes with putting your son at risk. Thank you for your love for us. God, I pray for your word here, the power of the word of God and the Holy Spirit to, to, to come together to do a work in the hearts of all of us today. We're so grateful for you, and we love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're going to talk today about Peter. So if you know anything about Peter, before Peter becomes Peter, he's known as Simon. And Jesus calls Simon the fisherman on the side of the, of the lake, mending his nets. And, he, and the word Simon or the name Simon means reed. Okay, the word Simon, the name Simon, uh, you should know that God, uh, your name means something, right? Names are important to God. So Simon's is a reed. A reed's are at the edge of the water, and they are blown to and fro, and it's a picture of the way Simon was, right? I, I feel like a reed sometimes. I was a reed before Christ. But then Jesus says to him, you are now no longer a reed. You are a rock. So there's this moment, and then they come to Jerusalem. Jesus is about to be crucified, and they're at the Last Supper. And what happens right before the ver these verses I'm going to read is that the disciples have had their feet washed by Jesus. They've had bread broken, and Jesus says, this is what's going to happen. And then just like the disciples do, they start arguing about who is going to be the greatest. Talk about a time and a place for something. Listen, I'm going to serve you by washing your feet. Listen, I'm going to go, all this thing that we've been talking about for three years, I'm going to go to the cross for you. My body's going to be broken. My blood is going to be shed. And then in response, the disciples are like, oh, this is going to be so great. Who's going to be the best, guys? Who's going to be the best? I bet it'll be me, Peter. I'm the rock. John's like, yeah, but I'm the one that Jesus loves. Who's going to be the best? And then Jesus responds with these scriptures. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, 
that he, may, he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you all that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said to him, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. So they're in this very intimate moment in their relationship with Jesus. And they're com- complaining and they're competing to, whether, uh, to see who is going to be the greatest. And Peter, who Jesus calls a rock, he even says, if you read it, um, when they're up at Caesarea Philippi, and they say, he says, you are no longer Simon. You are now Peter. You are now the rock. But then in this moment, Peter goes back to being Simon. That happens to me sometimes. I'm Aaron. I'm a son of the living God. I'm reborn and renamed by Jesus. I'm made new today. But sometimes I go back to being that guy. Anybody else? Just me and a couple. Okay, good. Thanks. (laughs) And what does Jesus say to these guys as they're complaining, as they're arguing? You're being reeds. You're being being who you were. This is not who you are. And he says this thing, which I think is very profound. He says, Satan has demanded you. He wants to sift you like wheat. And when he's talking, when he says you, it's a, it's a plural you. It's to the whole disciples. He's like, you know, you're talking about the things that aren't as important. And just so you know, the enemy is going to try to disrupt everything you do from here on out. See, if you and I want to do something profound for Jesus to make his name great, Satan has demanded you. He wants to sift you like wheat. He wants to take your life and shift it back and forth and up and down. Have you ever seen wheat? You know, you want to get the kernel off the stalk. I'm a farmer. I know how it works. Satan has demanded you. He wants to sift you like wheat. See, if you want to do something profound for God's name, do not be surprised if your life gets a little sifted. Do not be surprised. Do not blame God if life gets a little, what is happening right now? I signed up for this thing. I'm following the Savior of the world. He lives inside of me. He saved my life. But now life is way harder than it seemed like it used to be. It's because God plan for you is to do something mighty for his name, and the enemy will not like that. So don't be surprised. Don't be a victim. Be like, oh my gosh, my life is being sifted. That means that I'm a threat to darkness. That means that my life is having an impact for the kingdom, that my life will be defined not by how much I succeed, but by what God does through me. And that is a better story and a better life. Satan is demanding you. He's trying to sift you like wheat. But then he says this. This is interesting. Because what's going to happen is Peter's going to deny Jesus. That's a little spoiler alert. Sorry. If you didn't know. That's the rest, rest of the story. He says, but I, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So God's, but, but Jesus is going to advocate for you on your behalf. And then he says this, which is interesting. You've got to catch this. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. When you've turned back again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus is praying that you don't fail, but when you turn back, so when you, what he's saying is when you blow it, turn back and strengthen your brothers. So you know what? You and I are so afraid to fail, aren't we? Especially younger people. What if I fail? What if I blow it? Jesus is not praying for you not to fail. He's praying for you to come back. He's praying for you to come back and join together and strengthen each other. So maybe God defines failure not as messing up or acting out or doing whatever. Maybe he defines failure as not coming back to him. Maybe you and I fail when we refuse to receive the love and the grace and the mercy that was paid for on the cross. Maybe we fail when we refuse to come back to our brothers and sisters in Christ or when everything inside us, inside us wants to flight instead of come home. See, for my children, when they blow it, the first thing I want them to do is not be like, yeah, you blew it, come back and grovel at my feet. I want just to come home. You and I will fail. We will fail to do the thing that God wants us to do, not by the mistake we made, but by the refusal to receive God's mercy and to receive his grace. You see, you just, you have to be as much the younger brother and the prodigal son 
as the older brother. And when we don't come back, that's when we blow it. See, I used to to tell students when I was a youth pastor, I used to say, hey, you know what, you blew it, yeah, that's, you know what the enemy's greatest trick is? Is the length of time between your mistake and when you turn back. And maturity in Christ is not, not screwing up. It's shortening that length of time. It's that I am so aware that God's grace is so beautiful and undeserved and perfect that I can, in a moment, turn back to him, and I'm accepted. And that doesn't change, whether you've been a Christian for eight minutes or 80 years. But maturity is, I'm, I'm, I'm shortening that length of time between those two things. So you and I, we, get, we will fail. Jesus even says, okay, Peter, I'm praying that you don't deny me. That's not what he says. Jesus is saying, when you blow it, I'm praying that you come back and strengthen your brothers because that's what they need. And Peter, who's Peter, the rock all of a sudden, he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Anyone ever be like that with the Lord? Like, oh man, let's do it, God. Sometimes I get a little fired up about things, like, I don't care, let's go storm the gates of hell, and let's reach the whole city, and nothing's going to stop us, and then, and I get really, like, boasting in my own strength. And Peter's all of a sudden, no, 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 I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to blow, we're not going to scatter, I'm going to go with you wherever you go. And Jesus says, Peter, I tell you, it's not going to happen. The rooster's going to crow, and you'll deny me three times that you know me. See, sometimes God will allow you to do the things in your own strength. And sometimes God will allow you to do things in your own pride. And God will allow you to do things in his name, in your own strength, just so he can see how it goes. Not so he can be cruel. Not so he can be like, see, you moron. Can't say moron at church, sorry. It's like, see? You need me. You need me. So this is what happens. Jesus is arrested, and here's the rest of the story. It says in verse 54, And then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's home. This is in the middle of the night, and, and Peter is following at a distance. I thought you were going to go with me. Night at a distance, what's happening? And when they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, they sat down together, and Peter sat down among them. So he sat down, not with Jesus. So if you, if you look at this house, there's a courtyard in the Sadducees and Pharisees. Um, Jesus is up in the front being accused and tried and in this fake, phony, middle-of-the-night trial, right? And the Peter would be like, from me to the soundboard away, around a fire, with, with everyone else who's there just to see the show. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man was, was also with him. But he denied it and said, woman, I do not know him. And then a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I'm not. Not sure that's how it translates, but it's okay. (laughs) And after an interval of about an hour, so Peter's at a distance, he's listening, he's watching. Another still insisted to him, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And then immediately, while he was still finishing that sentence, have you ever had a sentence you just wish you could just pull back into your mouth? Like, I shouldn't have said that, honey, I'm sorry. Too late. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned. So think about this, the distance about this far away. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Their eyes met. And Peter remembered the Lord saying, what he had said before the, the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So if I could see a, something that was a failure, I would pick that. The Savior who saved me from being a fisherman, the Savior who, who said, that, I'm going to build the church on your life, Peter, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And look at what I did, how much I disappointed my Savior. That's failure, right? When I was a kid, we used to go to this church and had a balcony. Anyone ever go to church at a balcony? So me and my friends, when we were in high school, we used to go sit in the balcony because I was the furthest away from anyone and you could screw around the most, okay? Just so you know, sorry teenagers, there's no balcony here. 
but it was fun. We used to draw on the um, bulletins, you know, like hair and buck teeth and stuff. It was a blast. That's why we don't do bulletins in Fort Collins, because we don't need this being drawn on. But I used to sit up in the balcony, and my parents, my mom sang in the choir. They had a choir, and we would be screwing around, right? And that, that's what we did, and it was fun. And then all of a sudden, my mom's eyes would match my eyes. And unlike Jesus, they weren't full of love and compassion and support. They were like, we are going to have a talk when we get home. And I remember just being like, oh, no. Our, and I'm like, how can so far away? It was just like a, the power of a mom to be able to meet eyes from 100 feet away, 100 yards away. And that's kind of what happened. Except for the, when it says that Peter, Jesus looked at Peter, the context is he looked at Peter with compassion. Unlike my mom, <laughs> who was not happy. Jesus is like, see. And then Peter goes and he, he weeps bitterly. And then there's a lesson in how we respond to failure. Because you and I will blow it in life. Like, like you fully know the right thing to do and you will do the wrong thing. Anybody? Amen. Or some of you years and years ago have done the wrong thing, but yet you're still living like you're that person who did the wrong thing. If I would have only not failed, then God could use me. If I had only not failed, then maybe Jesus would be proud of me. Maybe I wouldn't have had the circumstances I have today. And you're defining your life on this failure. If Peter had, he had more right than any of us to define his life on his failure because of what he did. But what does Peter do? He comes back home and he gets his, the other people together. Because everyone deserts Jesus except for John, basically. So there's a lesson between two people. There's Peter and there's Judas. And you and I have an opportunity in the midst of our failure and our frustration and our struggle and the not sure financially things are going to work or if our marriage is going to work or what's going to happen. You and I have to get to be one of two people. We get to be like Peter who blew it, but they, he came back home. And he strengthened his brothers, sisters. And they strengthened each other. Or we could be like Judas, who escapes and runs away and takes his own life. Because the enemy is demanding that. So the beauty of failure is that you and I have the opportunity, and we are invited, and the eyes of Jesus are on you, not to be like, how dare you? But to be like, you know what, it's okay. You are my child. You are my brother, my sister. You are my friend. Come home. Come back. And you and I will feel the tension. Should I pull a Peter? Or should I pull a Judas? There's theologians that say, what if Judas would have showed up at the door? Broken. I'm sorry. I think a savior who died for the whole world would have restored a brother. So you and I get this profound opportunity in the midst of our failure to show and prove the love of Jesus by coming back. Our response to failure is not to run, it's to come back together. So on Sunday, Sunday morning, when you blew it Saturday night, the best place to be is a church. What, what better place to be? What a better example of God's unbelievable love and grace than to come to church with other broken people with other people who have blown it, other people who have received again and will continue receiving until we take that last breath. And there will be no more receiving God's grace. It will be abundant all the time, never ending. So, John chapter 20. This will be the second time that Jesus comes. He's resurrected from the dead. The disciples are still hiding. They're still afraid. They still don't know what to do. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked for the disciples were, f were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And when the disciples, then the disciples were glad when they saw that it was the Lord. So Jesus does his little teleport thing. I don't know how that works, but it's cool. I wish I could teleport. It'd be great. That hour drive to Fort Collins would just be boom, it'd be great. We're done. 
And what does Jesus do when he comes among his brothers? This is the second time he's seen them, but the last time that he saw them, they were arguing about who is the greatest, and then they abandoned him. Peter to his face. So what does Jesus say? How dare you? How dare you show your face here? How dare you come back? How dare you deny me? Remember all the stuff we did together? Is that what he says? No. Our Savior and your Savior says, peace be with you. And that's not like, hey, peace, man. That's like peace to the depths of your soul. Peace in your whole being. Jesus did not have to, when you come back to God, it is not a, oh, really, you're coming back here. We might have went to churches in some points in our lives that told us that. I did. Oh, sinners. Right? What does he say? He says, peace be with you, my brothers. And then he shows them what he did for them. Listen, I died. Look at, look at, this is real. See, the reason why you and I struggle sometimes with belief is we fail to come back and experience the Savior again. I was talking to someone this week, and they're like, man, I had such a hard time with the Mary and Martha story, where Martha's busy in the kitchen, and Mary's at Jesus' feet. And I know you're all thinking, Mary's so lazy. I do too. I'm like, man, that's kind of a jerk move. Seriously, Mary. But as I was, I was talking to someone about this, I was like, man, until you can be Mary, man, you'll never experience God's love the way you should. And if you continue to just be, try to be Martha, if you just try to, you're going to try to perform enough, what you'll create is this transactional relationship that, man, I did really good with God. I read my Bible this many times. I prayed for this many people. I didn't say that many bad words. Right? So now, God, I will receive your love. And God's like, you are missing out on the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is that we come to him in our doubt and in our brokenness and in our sin. And what he does is he says, now you can have peace. See what I did for you. See, in the face of your failure, mine, and my struggle and yours, because I got him, we could talk for hours. Jesus always responds to you with peace and with reminding you of what he's done for you. And he cares very little about how well you performed. That's hard sometimes. Romans 5, 8 says, For God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The best time to go back to God is while you are still working through it. While you're trying to get those words back in your mouth, oh gosh, I said that, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I acted that way, I shouldn't have acted that way. That's the best time. Because what Jesus will say is he will not accuse. See, the enemy accuses. You call yourself a Christian. Whew. You were worshiping a pretty good Sunday, but now Monday came. That doesn't look so good now, is it? Have you even read your Bible this week? It's like Wednesday. Have you, do you, have you acknowledged that I'm here? Is that God's voice? No. That's what we hear. What we should hear when we come back to the Savior is peace be to you. He'll show you what he's done. He'll remind you of what he's done. Because what he's done is nothing compared to what you can do. Not even close. While we were yet sinners, thank God he died for us. Then he says this again to him, peace be with you. Why does he say it twice? Seems strange. Have you ever been in awe of God? I bet they were in awe in that moment. And he was like, yeah, what you're seeing is true. This is happening. Because you know what? Receiving and having continuous access to grace and forgiveness and that God's mercies are new every day and we are new creation every morning, that is, blows our minds. That is not ideal to what the culture tells us. It doesn't fit. We're counterculture. It's a strange thing. So Jesus sometimes has to tell us again, hey, you're blown away right now. You should be. Peace be with you. That's the relationship he wants us to have with him. He wants us to come back to him to experience that depth of peace over and over again. And remember the joy of your salvation over and over again. See, in my life, I become more discontent when I forget about my initial salvation. When I forget about how I was a wretch, how I was broken, how I was so far from God, how I had no meaning and purpose, and then all of a sudden I experience that God has 
change my life and save me, and I have purpose for this world. And the, whew, the more I forget about that, the more discontented my life is. But when I come back to that, it's like a new, it's a new day. Nothing compares to that. My mortgage might be too expensive, but this is way better than that. My job's a pain, but this is way better than that. My kids don't listen, but neither do I. <laughs> Man, this is way better than that. Then Jesus does something really cool, I think. He says, peace be with you. As my Father has sent me, even so now I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he gave them this profound gift that we all have today in the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they will be forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness with any, it will be withheld. And so he, what is he saying? He's saying, I'm giving you my ministry. I, the, all the stuff we experienced these last three years, and it was crazy, crazy things. I'm giving you that ministry in the midst of your failure. See, the, the disciples didn't have enough time to perform to show Jesus that they were ready. The disciples didn't have enough time to do really good for a period of time. Okay, now I can serve God. In the midst of the most failure they could experience is when Jesus commissioned them. He gave them his ministry. Hey, you guys all deserve me. You know what? I'm giving you my spirit. And I'm giving you my ministry. Now go show the world. The thing that is, as Abe talks about growing the church and taking us to the next level as a church, it's not always a system or a process or a program or really good marketing. It's followers of Jesus who are not walking around like failures, but are walking around like saved, commissioned sons and daughters of God. And when that happens, that's when the church grows. That's when the gates of hell do not prevail. See, whenever we respond to Christ's forgiveness, he always commissions, commissions us, always. The woman who gets caught in adultery. Okay, you blew it. Now go into a program and figure it out. Programs are good. It says go and sin no more. Go as you're going. And he commissions the, us as followers of Jesus. As you're going, wherever you go, make disciples of all people. For I'm with you always. So you and I, we will fail. Jesus doesn't even pray that you don't fail. Do you realize that? He's not interested in your performance. He's interested in your heart. And that when we sin, and when we are selfish, and when we are proud, that we will come back to him. And in our humility, for receiving the love and the grace of God undeserved, is when he can use you the most. Because you'll be commissioned by God in the midst of your failure. And when that happens, I don't know about you, but for me, the thing that's changed my life radically was not that, oh man, now I can go be a pastor. That's going to be fun. It was like I had, s I realized that in my brokenness, God would use me. That he would use me to impact his kingdom and bring people to him. And that's not just because I am a pastor. It's because I'm a son or daughter. And you have to step out of the failure into the grace of God. He will say, he will give you peace. He will remind you of what he's done. And then he will commission you to do great things for his name. If you're feeling too much in prayer. We have to believe that as a church. We have to believe that as sons and daughters of God. We have to, some, sometimes I rely on my own strength. Sometimes I get so frustrated with the culture and the TV and the stuff. I'm like, ugh, anybody else? It's because I'm just trying to do it in my own strength. I'm trying to control. I'm trying to protect. I'm trying to prove. And God says to us, man, in your failure is when I will use you the most. In your mistakes is when I will do the biggest and deepest work in your heart. When you and I blow it in big and small ways, he'll be there. And we have to respond to him to receive the grace he's given us. So it doesn't mean, obviously, we just go and like, woo, suck it up, turn back, God. I don't think any of us struggle with that. I think what we struggle with is that there's a Savior that is continuously giving us peace and giving us rest. And I think we have to, 
in some ways repent for maybe how we've tried to perform. I've tried to do really good. I've tried to be the rock. But in reality, I'm just the reed. But when God comes and he engages with my life, then it changes everything. So let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I pray in your name, by your power, by your authority, that your spirit would lead us all to your truth right now. God, I pray for every heart here. I pray for the person first that feels like they're defined by a failure. They're defined by a mistake. God, I pray right now that you would, through your spirit, show them your mercy and grace and that they would receive from you. They do not have to be defined by those things, but they will be defined by a life that is forgiven and set free. And I pray for that person. So if you're here, every eye closed, if you're here and you're like, man, I feel like I'm defined by my failure. I feel like I'm, it's this thing that's always there. That's why God can't use me. If you're here, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just shoot your hand up. I want to pray for you. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, yeah, I see you. Yep, in the back, I see you. So just everyone, just put your hands out just as to receive from the Lord. We're just going to pray for every, we're going to pray together. Lord, I pray for every person here to, feeling like I, I can't be used by God because I've done this. I can't be used by God because I've thought this and I fully knew it was wrong. God, I pray right now by the power of your Holy Spirit, your spirit is just the words of our Savior. I pray that you would speak your truth, that you are forgiven, you are set free, you have worth, you have value, you are not defined by this, you are divine by being mine. I pray that your spirit would fill all of us to that. That no longer are we defined by our mistakes. But we are like Peter. We're defined by how we come back continuously to God. God, I pray for anyone here who feels like they can't be used by him for some reason. I pray that that would be taken away, taking off in the name of Jesus Christ. That you, we would walk out free and full of your peace, knowing that we have a Savior that loves us and that we are commissioned by him today. So Holy Spirit, just speak to us now. Just take a second and just have your, have your, have your time with him. Worship him, speak to him, pray to him. Maybe you, have to, maybe you have to repent for just trying to perform. Maybe you feel like your spirituality maybe outweighs the next, the next guys. And that's if God just wants to say, hey, just come back to me. Lord, thank you. It says in Lamentations 3, you know, a chapter that's not super happy and fun. It's a lament. This is what it says. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every single morning, and they are new today, because great is your faithfulness. I speak that over this group that we would receive for the first time, maybe, or maybe for the 5,000th time, but thank you that there is no end. God, I pray that we would walk out and leave this place commissioned by you to show your love, to speak on your, on your behalf, to live a kingdom mindset, to proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus to the world. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, next week, uh, Pastor Dave and Zan are back from study break and, tri and their missions trip, so you'd be excited to see them, welcome them, give them big hugs. Um, really honored to be here. Know that in Fort Collins, we really see you as a family. We're so honored to be part of this community and to say that we are not just a church over there by ourselves. We are part of a broader movement of God, and so we are so honored to do that with you. So thank you for your prayers, your support, and have a great week. We love you. Thank you.